Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In this lecture, we are going to look at dimensionality reduction. In the last lecture, I said there are two ways to reduce the dimensions of a data. Uh, one of them was feature selection, which we covered in the last lecture. And the second one is dimensionality reduction, which we are going to look at in this lecture. So what is dimension reduction? It is the process of mapping points in higher dimensional space to lower number of dimensions such that you are going to preserve as much as of the structure as possible. So you wish to preserve the structure of the data and when we say the structure of the data we are referring to things like pairwise distances. So if uh, there are two if there are three vectors, 1, 2 and 3, and the distance between 1 and 2 was higher than between 2 and 3, so you wish to reduce the number of dimensions, but you want to keep this property. So even in the reduced dimension, uh, the distance between 1 and 2 should be higher than uh, that bet uh, between 1 and 3. So you wish to keep that as much as possible, but reduce the dimensions. Now to understand what are the dimensions we look at uh, some of it in the last lecture. Let's look at a matrix. So consider a matrix, a data matrix D, and you have different samples D3, so on up to Dm. And oops, so. And like that. So you have the features so F1 and then F2 and so on up to Fn. So this is a uh, so D is going to be an M by N matrix having M rows and N columns. So when we say when we talked about feature selection, we said okay, let's completely you know let's pick this take this and completely discard this part. In dimension reduction, we don't do that. We are going to say that uh, let's keep the features, but instead of completely discarding, we are going to reduce the dimensions. So if I want this in two dimensions, I will keep it in two dimensions. So I'm going to keep the two dimension, but I'm not just simply going to remove this part of the matrix. What I'm going to do is I'm going to project values in the other dimension onto these two dimensions. That is how we reduce the dimensionality. So this is different from simple feature selection. In feature selection, you completely remove the features. And this you don't you remove the features, but you take the projection of the data onto the ones you are keeping. So that's the difference between uh, the two. So it's useful for further processing of the data. It takes less computation, fewer parameters, easy to understand and easy to visualize. So let's look at the first of the two algorithms that we will be discussing. The first one is the principal component analysis. Maybe some of you have done it. it image processing. So what is a principal component analysis? Uh, PCA is a dimensional reduction method that is often used to reduce the dimensionality of large data sets by transforming a large number of variables into a smaller one that still contains most of the information in the large set. So just as we said that we wish to uh, preserve as much structure as possible. So how does PCA work? So suppose you have your data matrix X. So this D instead of D we have X. Uh, the first thing you have to do is uh, so if you have uh, this X which is of size N so N rows and D columns and one vector uh, one row here is represented as X of N. So the first step you are going to do is you are going to subtract the mean x from each row vector x n in the matrix. So if you have the matrix 
uh, and this is a vector xn so each value here you are going to uh, apply this uh, formula to it so the value minus the mean of this entire vector divided by the standard deviation of this vector and that resultant value here you are going to keep here and then move on to the next one and then replace all the values using this formula so this is called standardization so you have standardized uh, the data set it means all the values are now in uh, basically in units of standard deviation so deviation from the mean in units of standard deviation so you know one sigma standard deviation is usually represented as sigma so if you have one it means that the deviation is one sigma if you have 1.5 it means the deviation is 1.5 sigma from the mean so once the data is transformed and you have the standardized uh, set or the standardized version of the data set the next thing you are going to do is compute the covariance of the matrix x so the covariance means uh, you take so if this was uh, the first feature f1 and f2 then you take f1 and f2 you compute the covariance and so on so let the result of the computing the covariance of the matrix be sigma so you took x you had the original data set x you standardize it using this formula you compute the covariance matrix from the original data matrix or the standardized data matrix and number three you find the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of sigma sigma is the covariance matrix of x so you take sigma and then you find the eigenvalues and eigenvector and finally you keep only the principal components and the principal components are if you want to keep m principal components it means you are compute you are keeping the m eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues so the first comp principal component account for the largest possible variance principal components means those eigenvalues and eigenvectors with the largest variance in the data so in other words if you are keeping m eigenvectors you are keeping m uh, largest variances in the data set and once you are done with that the next the final thing you do is uh, you recompute the original uh, data set how you take the feature vector the feature vector is gained after you take only the m uh, eigenvectors so how many possible eigenvectors can you have eigenvector eigenvalues if your data set was completely uh, if it had a rank of D it means all the columns were independent of each other so you would have a rank of D so out of this D you are keeping M eigen vectors and M eigen values so you're reducing uh, the size uh, from D to M and this reduced size is then multiplied by the uh, standardized format to multiply the two and you get the original data set this is how you compute the PCA now let's look at how this works so suppose I have the data and I plot the data in a 2d format so this is my graph this is my, these are my y x this is my y axis and this is my x axis so this white one here represent the x and the y axis uh, respectively so as you can see that the variance is not along the x axis or along the y axis the highest variance is along this red line so this is going to be my first principal component after i have computed this then i will look at the second principal component which is this blue line now whenever you're calculating this the principal components have to be orthogonal to each other which means they have to make a 90 degree angle that's why i didn't uh, so this is the first eigen uh, this is the first principal component, uh, the highest variance probably here, but I'm not going to take a line like this. So perhaps, uh, perhaps it could be something like this, but I'm not going to take that. I'm going to take this Y because this makes a 90 degree angle. So this is a 90 degree angle. 
So these are orthogonal to each other. And to understand how we compute the first principal component or what's the meaning of the uh, these principal components, let's look at this uh, animation. So you can see uh, these blue data points are plotted on the uh, x and y axis and this line here is crossing through the origin of these uh, values. So what happens is that at each instance you can see these red lines. So this black line is the, all the possible lines I could have drawn. This, this is rotating. So these represent all the possible lines I could have drawn. Once I'm drawing these lines, these here are the projections. So what I'm going to do is, as you can see at, uh, maybe at this point, you can see that they are very close to other, each other, these red points, and very close to this origin. So the variance between that line, those red points and this is highest when the line aligns itself with this pink line. So this is where I'm going to get the highest variance. So, so this is going to be something like this should have passed through the origin here. Uh, this line here has the highest variance among these data points, these red dots and this origin. So if you compute the variance, so this is the average uh, if you compute the variance between all the points, the variance will be higher at this point. So that is why this uh, pink line will have the highest uh, variation and therefore it becomes the first principal component. And since the second principal component has to be orthogonal to the first one, that's why uh, this will be the second principal component. And then you can move on to the third and the fourth and the fifth and all of them will be orthogonal to each other. Orthogonal means at 90 degrees to each other. So in this way, if the data matrix had all the columns independent of each other, and then the rank of the matrix would have been size D, and therefore you would have uh, obtained D principal components. And the first one, this one, since this is the most important principal component, it means it's the one that's going to have the highest eigenvalue. And this is going to have the second highest eigenvalue and so on. So looking at these eigenvalues, we can then calculate how many uh, principal components we wish to keep. And it's going to simply be that we keep the top ones that we want and then uh, put to zero the lower ones. So if I have a data that has 100 principal components, and I want to project it into a 3D, uh, three dimensions, I'm going to keep the first three principal components and then remove the rest 97 principal components and then uh, regenerate the data which we saw over here. We said that, you know, if you have this, keep the largest M uh, principal components and then multiply the feature vector by having only the M components with the standardized version and you'll get the uh, final data set, the approximated uh, data set. And this approximated data set now has, so if the original matrix had uh, D dimensions, this one will have M dimensions because you just kept M eigenvectors. So this is reducing the dimensions from D to M. And then you can use the data set for whatever you were doing, clustering, classification, whatever you were doing. So you can, instead of using the original data, you can now use the data which has only D dimensions. So this is a MATLAB code of how you can obtain, uh, how can you can apply the PCA. So you just have, a, so this is to generate the data. You can plot the data to see those two parts, are the, this first line is generating the data. This is just uh, giving a plot. And then you are standardizing the data, so data minus mean. And uh, then you can uh, make a, covariance data out of this and then uh, use the PCA covariance on this covariance data. You will get the principal components that are the eigen uh, vectors, uh, the variations, the eigen values and uh, the details. Uh, this is just a, uh, an explanation from MATLAB of what is the meaning of this. So you can plot the original data and you can plot the uh, reconstructed data. You can plot the 
if you got PC you can have one one and one two and then you can see how it works so similar to the question we asked in the last video how many features do I keep and the next question here is how many principal components do I keep and the rule of thumb is that just like in the previous one we uh, you know made a graph where we have the number of features and we had the information gain of those features and then we selected in this case we are going to have the eigenvectors and the variation variance explained by the ith eigenvector so the first principal component have this much percentage of the variance and the second one have this variance and the third one has this variance and so on and ideally you would like so in this case just having one principal component is not enough so this is 30 maybe 36 37 you add this which will become 57 you add maybe this it will become around 69 or 70 then you add some other ones ideally you would like to take enough eigenvectors to cover 80 to 90 percent of the variance so if you sum all these variations then you need to keep the number of principal components so that 18 to 90 percent of the various variance is covered so only the lower uh, values of variance so the only the lower principal components will be uh, deleted and the you keep enough principal components to cover 80 to 90 percent of the variance in the data because we said we need to keep it as close as possible to the original matrix if you lose uh, more than that then uh, maybe you lose the structure of the data and that's uh, not good because then you will have totally different results so the original matrix and the reconstructed matrices will have very different results if you lose a lot of variation so here is an example of uh, an application of pca so you can see here we have the average face of a person and if we just use the first principal component you can see that we can find the outline of that person and then you can keep having the second and the third and the fourth and so on and if you combine all of these components you will end up getting the original uh, data point and if i want to make an approximation then i will say okay let's remove this and this and then uh, keep the rest and then make this so you will lose some detail but uh, since these are the ones that have the least uh, variation so it means the information lost will be the lowest here is another use of the PCA so it can be used for instance for compression so instead of you know saving the entire image you just uh, have each, each new image can be approximated by projection onto the first few principal components so you can just project it on the first few uh, components and then you can get a compressed version of the image and for recognition of a new image you project it to the first few components and then match the feature vectors with uh, the data sets you're trying to match so if i want to if i have face and i want to see if this face exists in the original database i don't have to take the entire face and keep the database of the entire faces i can just keep the maybe first five or six principal components of my data set and from my test data i also take the first five principal components and do the matching on the five first five principal components instead of having the entire data so that's a good application of pca another one could be for instance to regain the elimination so if you have this value and this is the first principal component the second third fourth and just by using the five uh, first five principal components you are able to uh, illuminate this image which is the dull image you are able to illuminate the image so there are a lot of stuff that you can do with pca what you need to just understand is that if you are keeping five principal components it means you are keeping the five most important aspects of the data the ones that have the highest variation and where you have the highest variation is the important because that's, that's where the changes is happening that's where the things are changing from one sample to the other sample that's the most important part so that means that the first uh, principal component or the first uh, component with the highest variation is the most important part of the data so just by using five of them you can re-eliminate the image and finally we look at this example this is an example of a, a sensor lab of university of california at berkeley 
So this is their lab and these one, two, three, four up to I think 54 are uh, they have placed different sensors across the lab. Uh, maybe they are sensing temperature or humidity or light or something like that. But they have placed these sensors and uh, what we have, well, what we can see here is uh, if this is the sitting area or this is the storage area and different part of the building, uh, the sensors are usually around that and not in this part. Similarly here this is the lab, this is the server and uh, these are the stairs. You can see that uh, there are no sensors over here but the sensors are around this part. So what we can do is we can look at the distance between uh, each pair of sensor. So there are 54 uh, sensors. So I can make a matrix of 54 by 54 and note the distance between each pair of sensor. So this distance for instance between 2 and 4 is this between 1 of 2 is this and I can look at the link quality. So maybe these are some kind of uh, maybe routers or something or some kind of sensor that you can uh, that connect to each other and you can measure the link between these uh, sensors. So if you plot this, this is how the data looks like the distance between uh, the sensors and the link quality and if you so this is a 54 by 54 matrix because there are 54 sensors if you do a PC projection and you bring it down to just two dimensions it means uh, you want to project it on a, onto two dimensional space. So if you project it onto a two dimensional space and then plot it uh, this is the result and you can see here pretty much the same as this. So you have these empty areas sensors all around it and an empty area and sensors all around it. So you just uh, you didn't have the location of these sensors you just had the uh, the distance between them and the link uh, the strength of the link between them and from that you were able to plot the entire map of the lab. It's not a very accurate map because we just um, uh, maybe one some of the sensors is always one sensor is on the ceiling the other is on the ground floor so we are losing some information when we are uh, you know using a 2d map so this is probably not a 2d map there are walls between uh, things so we are losing a lot of things we are just assuming that this is on a plain 2d surface but even with that we are able to get a pretty good approximation of the location of the sensors now that was a principal component analysis we saw how it works and uh, what it does and what are its uses another one is the singular valued decomposition but to understand that we have to look and revise at some of the concepts regarding linear algebra because uh, well SVD is basically based on linear algebra so just to recall you must have done this in your uh, linear algebra course so if you have an eigenvalue eigen vector decomposition it means that if you have a matrix uh, S and uh, vector V so S V equal to lambda V this is called the eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition where V belongs to R of M M here is the dimension and this is not zero it means you cannot have a vector of entire zeros and uh, lambda is the eigenvalue so suppose you had uh, this example so this is s so you have this matrix and this is v which is this vector so if you multiply it so 6 into 1 and 2 minus 2 into 4 this is going to be 6 minus 4 which is 2 and then 4 into 1 and 0 into 2 which is 4 so you have this 2 4 and you can get the same result by multiplying this vector with this value so this was the matrix this was the vector and you could have simply multiplied it by 2 so th what this tells me is that uh, this is the vector the first value of the vector has uh, is going to be multiplied by 2 so this is giving me the directions and this is giving me the strength so this is the interpretation of the eigenvector and the eigenvalue the eigenvector is giving me the, the directions and the eigenvalue is giving me the strength of this uh, vector. So 
how many eigen values can we have at most uh, again as i said previously if you have if s has um, a full rank matrix it means that all the columns are independent so you can have as many uh, eigen vector eigen value as uh, the dimension of the original matrix s so only has non zero solution if s minus lambda i equal to 0 and this is the mth order equation in lambda which means that it can have at most m distinct solutions so m distinct solution only in the case where uh, the rank is m it means they are all independent of each other so let's look at this uh, multiplication and this this is another repetition so if i have s as this so i can see that um, here i have uh three vectors so i can take the first vector and i can make it into a unit vector so instead of 3 0 0 i can put it 1 0 0 so this is the corresponding eigen vector corresponding to this but to get 3 i need to mention that the eigen value here is 3 so if, if multiply 3 by this vector we are going to get this vector and similarly this one is 0 1 0 and i need to get back this middle vector i need to multiply it by 2 so 2 is the eigen value and v2 is the eigen vector and similarly i have 0 0 1 and uh, this is going to be multiplied by a 0 so these are the eigen value eigen vector decomposition of a matrix and um, similarly if i had x as 2 4 6 i could have written it as this so what happens is that when you are using a symmetric matrix a symmetric matrix means that s is symmetric and the eigen vectors for the distinct eigen values are orthogonal orthogonal means they are at 90 degrees to each other so what this means is that if i have s v 1 2 and uh, i make this lambda and v then uh, lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2 or in other words their dot product will be zero because they are orthogonal to each other so all the eigen values of a real symmetric matrix will be real and all the eigen values of a positive semi definite matrix are non negative What's the positive semi-definite matrix? It's a matrix as such that W transpose W will always be greater or equal to zero. So this is basic linear algebra. And uh, another thing we need to uh, take into account uh, is that let S so S is our matrix size m by n because it is uh, now a square symmetric matrix with m linearly independent eigen vectors. uh the theorem states that there exists an eigen value decomposition such that s is equal to u lambda u inverse so what is this u and u inverse and what is this lambda u and u inverse are uh, the eigen vectors of s and lambda is the eigen value of s so this is a, a decomposition the first one was a two part decomposition this is a three part decomposition so u lambda and u inverse so this uh, lambda is a diagonal matrix having the eigen uh, values and u and u inverse are having the eigen vectors so uh, so far in the second part we have been looking at linear algebra and uh, you might be asking you know this was a class about ai why are we studying linear algebra and the reason we are studying it is because as i said uh, the whole concept of dimensional reduction is based on matrices row space null space rank eigen value eigen vector decomposition what's the meaning of that what's the interpretation of that so if you don't know it perhaps you can revise your notes perhaps you can look at this applied mathematics book by uh, strang uh strang is a professor at mit or you can look at this uh, video link in which he describes the eigen vector eigen value decomposition so this is going to be a good refresher 
So let's come to what we want to do because our job is not about linear algebra. Our job is to find the dimension to reduce the dimensions of the matrix. So just as we saw here s equal to u lambda u inverse. Similarly, there exists uh, what is called a singular value decomposition such that if A is a matrix, A can be decomposed into U sigma V transpose. So if A is a matrix like this, so it's a rectangular matrix, this is A, its size is uh, M into N. So this means 1 up to m rows and 1 up to n columns. This can be reduced into u which is going to be of so this is a squared symmetric matrix of size m into m. This is u multiplied by uh, oops. a diagonal matrix M into N and uh, this will have only entries here so this is Sigma so let me call let me call this oops sigma 1 sigma 2 and so on and all the other values will be 0 so only the entries in the diagonal and all other values are 0 and this is called the sigma matrix and then multiplied by uh, so n by n matrix which is called v so any matrix A can be decomposed into this. What's the meaning of this? This U here is the eigenvectors of A A transpose. What is A A transpose? A A transpose is the dot product between all pair of rows. So if I compare this just like in uh, the hierarchical clustering or in k means you are calculating the distance the euclidean distance between all rows if i just take the dot product so i'm not calculating the distance instead i am calculating the similarity and that similarity is the dot product and i take a dot product between all possible combinations so between 1 and 2 1 and 3 1 and 4 so on up to 1 and m then 2 and 1 2 and 2 2 and 3 2 and 4 up to 2 and m and so on i take all possible values so it's going to be an m cross m matrix of uh, all possible uh, similarities so this is a a transpose u is basically the eigen vectors of this uh, a a transpose and a a transpose are the similarity values of the dot product between all possible rows sigma here will come to that in a moment V here is the same thing, but instead of A, A transpose, we are taking A transpose A. This means the same thing that we did with the rows here, we are doing with columns. So I am going to take the similarity with the dot product between this column and this column, this column and the third, this column and the fourth, this column and the nth column, then second with the first, second with the second, second with the third, so on. So at the end, I am going to have n cross n this was m cross m so v here is the so are the eigenvectors of a a transpose so the row wise similarity and the column wise similarities similarity they're not exactly similarity they're dot products and lambda is a unique feature of this similar value decomposition is that when you can compute the eigenvectors so as we saw that uh, s v is equal to lambda v lambda was the 
eigen uh, values so in this special case the eigen values of a a transpose and a a transpose are the same so you can have to have same eigen values and these same eigen values are these sigma and they are represented in the form of a diagonal so basically when we calculate the eigen values we actually take the square root of the eigen values rather than the eigen values themselves which form this sigma and so this is a diagonal matrix what this really means there is in the coming few slides there is a very good interpretation of exactly what we did here so far we are just looking at it from the mathematical perspective but in the following slide you will see a very good interpretation of exactly what is happening and uh, which is why mathematics is a very important branch and uh, just because you are computer scientist it doesn't mean that you don't need mathematics in fact it needs it means that you are going to be needing a lot of mathematics if you are going into data science if you are going to, to machine learning into artificial intelligence there is no way you can get rid of uh, particularly linear algebra calculus and probability and statistics so you have to be a master of uh, these two things if you want to go into data science or machine learning or ai anyway let's come back to the topic so what we are trying to do is just like the pca we reduced the number of eigen values and we reapproximated the original solution so here also what we want to do is we want to have the original matrix a back so this was our matrix a we decompose it using u sigma and v transpose we want to have our original matrix back with a rank x uh, such that uh, with a rank k sorry such that the matrix a minus the matrix x and x is a rank k uh, matrix such that the diff uh, the difference between this the frobenius norm between these two matrix is minimum what is the frobenius norm it simply uh, is a squared sum of the values so if you have a matrix like this m rows n column if this is the matrix a so all entries here are a i j we have a sum over i and a sum over j it means all the rows and all the columns it means all the elements of the matrix simply just squaring all the elements of the matrix and taking their under root so the distance between the original matrix and the approximated matrix this distance should be minimum so you are trying to find a reduced dimension a uh, k such that so you are trying to find a k such that the difference between the original matrix and the approximated matrix is minimum and what it means is minimum in this form so a k and x are both m by n matrices so if this was m by n a of k will also be m by n doesn't look the same uh, because of my poor drawing but uh, that's why we mention here m by n so it means they are the exact same dimension so i have reduced the dimensions but the size of the matrix remains the same so where is the reduction you will ask me it was m by n it's still m by n where is the reduction and the reduction is that this original matrix would have a rank so this rank of a would have been n the number of columns or what could have been uh, the max of the number of rows or columns in this case the rank of a of k is k and uh, k here is much smaller than n here we write with r but in this example you can say n because the rank of this was n so k is much much smaller than n it means that the number of independent rows and columns in this matrix are only k whereas the number of independent rows and columns in this matrix was n 
or maybe R if you like. So I can replace this with uh, just to make it consistent. I can say the original matrix was R, and here it is. Uh, so instead of this, I am going to use R. I uh, so the uh, sorry the rank of this matrix is much smaller than this, but the sizes of the matrices are the same. So what this means is that if the data was in 2D and I decided just you know this is 2D so the rank here is uh, 2 because this is in 2 dimension we have this and we have this if I decide to make the rank equal to 1 it means I have to make a projection on the axis that I am keeping so this data point this is the actual vector that goes to this data point what I mean by taking making the rank from 2 to 1 is I am basically taking a projection of this along the x axis. So when I take the projection of this value along the x axis and then I completely uh, you know forget about the y axis the size of the matrix will remain the same but now it is going to be just the projection of this along the x axis and there is no projection along the y axis. The projection along the y axis has been made to 0. So this is what it means. So the size of the matrix does not change but the rank changes and because the rank changes I am going from 2D to 1D. So where does the second D go? The second D basically uh, transform into projection to the 1D. That is the concept behind it what is happening. To understand that so that was the mathematical part to understand what really is going on let us look at this data. So we have a 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, samples. So these 4 documents are related to CS and the next 3 documents are related to medical. We have 7 documents, 4 related to computer science and 3 related to medicine. And these are the 5 uh, words or the terms. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. As expected data information or retrieval, these occur in only uh, CS related documents and brain and lung uh, this occur in only uh, medical related documents. So if we have so this is the original matrix uh, instead of so this matrix here is uh, this and uh, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 so these are the 7 documents and these are the 5 words. So once I do my SVD so when I, when I said SVD was a equal to u sigma v transpose so this is my a this is my sigma and this is my v transpose uh, sorry this is not my a this is my a over here this is my u so what is u u is the eigen vectors of a transpose and V is the eigen vector of A transpose A and sigma is the combined eigen values of both of them. So what we can see over here is very interesting. If I look at this matrix I can if I if I were to find patterns I can say there are two basically the two basic blocks or two concepts. So this is the first concept and this is the second concept. So this document here let me call this D1, D2, D3 and so on up to D7. So D1 belongs to the first concept, D2 belongs to the first concept, D3 to the first, D4 to the first but D5 to the second. You can see the same thing over here. So this says that uh, the, this is D1, this is D2 and so on up to D7. So this says that this belongs to the first concept and uh, not to the second concept. So it belongs to the first concept. The eigenvector is this. The eigenvalue is this. So this multiplied by the first concept and this multiplied by the second concept of course this is 0 so this will end up 0. This is the interpretation of what we are doing. 
So document one belong to the first concept, but not to the second concept. You can see that explicitly over here. This is one and this is five. So this has a very strong belonging. We can see that with this value. This value is higher. Data also belong to the first concept. Information belongs to the first concept. Retrieval belong to the first concept. Brain to the second and lung to the second. You can see it over here. This is data. This is information. This is retrieval. This is brain and this is lung. So you can see door doesn't belong to the first, belongs to the second, and uh, so on. So this is two, three, one, two, three, one. Exact same thing. You have exact same values, right? So one, 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 two, 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 one, 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 five, five, five. Exact same values. Exact same values. So this is the interpretation of what we are doing. So you can see it over here. This is the CS concept. This is the medical concept. So this is the strength of the CS concept. This is the strength of the medical concept. This is the strength of the word data with the CS concept. So from this, if I wanted to remove, so now we have two concepts. So since we have two concepts here, or since this is of size two by two, so what is the rank of this? The rank here is two. So we have two concepts. And why is the rank? You know, one, two, three, four, five. We had five columns. So we had seven rows and five columns, but rank equal to two. What's the rank of the matrix? The rank of the matrix, as I said before, it's the number of independent rows or independent columns. Is it possible to create this column with this column? Yes, multiply this column by one, you get this. So they are the same thing. So if this was column C1 and this one is C2, so basically C2 is equal to C1 and similarly C3 is equal to C1. So C1 here is the first rank because 1, 2 and 3 can simply be obtained here. But uh, this cannot be obtained from C1. So for this I need to have uh, C4 and then I can say that C5 equal to C4, C4 equal to C4. So just by having C1 and C4, I needed these two main uh, vectors and all the others can be simple linear combinations of these two vectors. So I needed C1 and I needed C4. These are the two ranks of the matrix. And these are the two concepts that are formed from this matrix. So if I wanted to make it into, uh, if I want to reduce the concept, I said no, I want to transform it into one concept. What do I do? I simply, instead of just making changes all over, I said, okay, this is, uh, this is sigma 1, this is sigma 2. Put sigma 2 equal to 0. Basically, remove this, replace it by 0. And then multiply these three matrices. When you multiply these three matrices, this is the result. So this is A and the rank of A equal to 2. And this is A of K and the rank of equal to 1 and you see that by putting just this value equal to 0 that's the only change I did and then multiply these three matrices back to get the original matrix we get this so the higher concept is kept the lower concept is removed this is a very similar concept to the first principal component and the second principal component the higher value so the higher singular value is kept the lower singular value is deleted. These sigma are called singular value. That's why singular value decomposition. These are the singular values. You kept the first singular value and you deleted the second singular value. By deletion, I mean you put it to zero, multiply the three matrices to reconstruct your original matrix and you get. So this is exactly as it was before. 
no change between this and this because you kept this this concept this is the concept that you deleted so you deleted this and you can see the effect over here so this was deleted this was kept and this is the low rank approximation so ak is a low rank approximation to the original matrix a and the low rank mean it's the k rank approximation so i only have k rank here so the way to do it is uh, the way to apply this in real life is you have the original matrix you compute the svd you keep the number of dimensions you like so if this was maybe five dimension you had sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 sigma 4 and sigma 5 because this is always going to be a diagonal matrix these are also going to always going to be zero here so if you want to keep three dimensions you keep the first three you say this is equal to zero and this is equal to zero and then you remultiply so just any dimension you want you only have to change this matrix so decompose the original matrix change this matrix multiply back get the approximated matrix and do whatever you want to do if you want to do clustering classification whatever you wanted to do you can do it with this approximated matrix so this is another example uh, which is very similar so you see in, in this case it was a perfect decomposition so there was no uh, you know mismatches so this was a perfect block this was a perfect block in this case we can see that uh, you have uh, maybe you have this value here and then you have this here but there is some overlap here and the, there is some overlap here so it's not necessarily two concept so maybe the first concept and the second concept uh, the third concept and the fourth concept that's why you see four concepts over here and as you can see the first concept is very high the second concept is very high the third and the fourth are significantly lower so if we want to keep two concept you just put this equal to 0 put this equal to 0 reapproximate it and you will get uh, so you get the uh, new matrix and then you can do whatever you like with the new matrix so that's the concept of similar valued decomposition it's a very very powerful concept and it's used a lot in uh, machine learning ai and data science so to summarize what we have done uh, at the previous lecture we looked at the difference between the feature selection and dimensional reduction we just discussed it in this lecture as well so the first one is selecting the subset of features and discarding the others that's feature selection the second one is selecting subsets of dimensions and discarding others we not discarding features we are discarding dimensions when we the difference between them is that in this case the entire columns are deleted in this case either they are not deleted or if they are deleted then their projections to the columns that we are keeping are incorporated so that is the difference between the two the feature selection and the dimension reduction we looked at pca reduces physically reduces the dimensions and you keep the top principal components in singular value the physical size of the matrix is not deleted but the rank is reduced and the number of dimensions are reduced and you only keep the top singular values so how many features to keep you can plot the the result and you can have a graph like this so you can have the number of features uh, so this is the first feature the second the third and so on and here you can have the uh, m i score so the first one is high the second one is high the third one is high and then you have something like this so you know you are going to keep this and you are going to discard this because they have low mutual information they have high information you keep this and you discard this and same goes with the dimensions here uh, if you had pca then you can also plot it and you keep enough of this to get between 80 to 90% of the variation
and same goes with similar uh, components you can keep the top components such that you retain the majority of uh, the concepts but you eliminate the lower concept the concept that had lower strength in them so with this uh, we finish the part of the course with the new topics that we discuss all the topics that we have we wanted to discuss we have done uh, the next two weeks will be about case studies uh, which i will uh, upload at a later stage so it's some experiments i did you know how uh, you take a data and how you apply all these uh, things that we have studied so far and sometimes work and sometimes it doesn't work and then you go to if it doesn't work one way you try another way and uh, we also are going to look at the Veka toolbox which is a very handy approach it's a free very handy approach you can use it uh, for quick calculations and for quick applications of many uh, AI and machine learning algorithms in that so I hope you enjoyed the video and if there are any questions regarding this lecture or any other previous lecture you can simply ask uh, in MS Teams you can email me or you can ask during the question answer hour so that's it for this course I hope you enjoyed it uh, thank you very much